Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Angles and Attitudes. My partner, John. John, how you doing on this? Hey, good afternoon. evening, Mark. Hey, today we got a return guest, and we're really excited about it. Um, he's written over 21 baseball books. He's a historian for the Chicago Baseball Museum. You know him, you love him. George Castle. George, thanks for jumping on, and welcome back to the podcast. How's it going, George? Uh, great. Uh, John, Mark, uh, glad uh, to be back. And, uh, uh, you know, it's great to talk baseball and it's great to talk history. So I'm in my element. And thanks. Thank you for putting me squarely in there. There you go. Well, thanks for joining. So we're going to start with uh, your latest and greatest project. I know John's got a copy of it and um, he started to, to read that as well. So uh, Chili Dog MVP, Dick Allen, the 1972 White Sox and a transforming Chicago. A lot of stuff in there, um, so we're going to turn it over to you and kind of let and that kind of but let you break that down because, as I said, from Dick Allen being a um, a polarizing figure, somebody who's not who wasn't understood to a team that nobody seemed to want to a political situation in the city of Chicago, all that stuff mixed together. Take it away from there, George. It's almost uh, the old Mike Murphy. Uh, I, we had 10 pounds to stuff into a five pound bag. And uh, it was my decision. I'm sort of the general manager of this book, not the lead author. Although I'm, uh, uh, I, I contributed about 20,000 words of writing in there. So what we wanted to do is not only recreate the amazing season that Dick Allen had, he was a one man gang for the White Sox, won the MVP and completed their comeback from total irrelevance in the market only two years before when they lost a team record 106 games. The White Sox were in first place on September 1st. And uh, uh, the, if, if Dick Allen in subsequent uh, years had not gotten hurt, the White Sox might have uh, achieved parity if not exceeded the, the Cubs standing in this town. And, and we backtracked uh, in the book for decades how that happened. But it's not only a book about Dick Allen's memorable season and the White Sox, the little team that could, challenging the soon-to-be dynastic Oakland A's for the American League West title, but also a book about Chicago at a time when the Black community would not just obey uh, what the Democratic machine wanted it to do, and that is contribute votes and get very little back. They rebelled against the machine, and also... Uh, it was a time of, as, as I said, great change in Chicago. It, you know, 50 years later, it hasn't eradicated poverty and crime and things like that. But it's nice to see people stand up for themselves. And against this background, uh, a lot of people from all walks of life and all races came together in old Comiskey Park to cheer for uh, Dick Allen and the White Sox. It was also a time when Harry Carey became popular in Chicago. Uh, most people think of Harry Carey as the uh, uh, Harry Carey presents Cubs baseball, mm -hmm. but it was even on a little network of suburban radio stations that Harry Carey first became the toast of Rush Street here and really became popular. And, and, and some of his best broadcast work uh, was done in his uh, decade-long stint with the White Sox from 1971 through 1981. Also, Nancy Faust became the most prominent organist in baseball. She started uh, was the first organist to start uh, doing walk-up tunes for players, mm -hmm. starting with Dick Allen's Jesus Christ Superstar. And uh, Nancy was so popular, she worked for every Chicago team except the Cubs and the Bears, and the Cubs wanted to hire her. Wow. It, it, I have to tell you, uh, George, love the way th this book starts out. I uh, started reading it. I'm in the maybe four or five chapters. I was telling Mark about it. I mean, you really, you guys really depicted everything that was going on. No one would have ever thought of this. I mean, you really had to really follow baseball in Chicago. I know you're going to get into the thing about how the White Sox were on WFLD and how that almost was going to be the bomb for them because at the time and then getting Harry into that booth, of course, after the veteran Jack Drees, who was announcing those games on TV with um, he had a fling with the on deck show with uh, the lefty 
that now that has erased my mind, Billy Pierce. And then all of a sudden, when G when Harry went to the television side, it was the start of a change. And you really depict so many things in the book that were like, wow, I remember that. And, you know, how did you get to that where you had to dig to find? And there's some unbelievable pictures also in the book, but take us through those um, early years, especially like you said, from the trade for Tommy John, whether we trade Tommy John to the Dodgers, we get Hunts and we get Allen. Take us from there. Well, again, the Sox had revived kind of on their own, having hired Chuck Tanner and uh, Roland Hemet as the basically the, the the general manager without title at near the end of the 1970 season. If we back everything up, the White Sox had that 17 year run as the Gogo White Sox. They were the uh, a, uh, almost a consistent contender. The fact that they did not have a good, a good lineup, they did not have good run producers, cost them several pennants in the 1960s because uh, they had great pitching, but they couldn't back it up. And from 1963 to 1965, the White Sox won 90, 94 games each year and finished second each time. You know, they were 30 years too soon for the wild card. And, uh, but that era kind of ground to an end uh, in 1960, after the 1967 season, when the Sox failed to win a doubleheader in Kansas City and lost out in a very close four team American League race. But they were a boring team um, with really no offense. They had actually watered down the infield and dampened baseballs to help their pitchers, but they hurt their hitters. Uh, and, but that was not what the public wanted to see. Football, the NFL was coming on very strong, and baseball overall was uh, considered in some respects boring. So uh, you had that with the Cubs coming on under Leo DeRocher uh, with their good young team and the veterans, Banks, Williams, and Sano, Fergie Jenkins starting his run of uh, six straight 21 seasons. They captured the town, and owner Arthur Allen uh, saw his White Sox lose both on the field and at the gate to the point where uh, when the Cubs are flying high in 1969, he just, uh, you know, threw up his hands and said, I, I can't do this anymore. And so Bud Selig, who had been trying to replace the Braves in Milwaukee uh, since the Braves left after the 1965 season, uh, they reached a verbal agreement to transfer the Sox to Bud, owner, Bud Selig's ownership. Um, but the hero, uh, the unsung hero of the book was Arthur Allen's brother, John Allen, who uh, stayed in the background. But since the Allen family had bought the team from Bill Veck in 1961, John Allen actually was half owner of the team. He had veto power over a sale. So Arthur Allen says, fine, you take over the White Sox. John Allen was committed to keeping them in Chicago and Comiskey Park. Um, it was that close to a sale. However, I, I must say uh, the sale was not uh, a fait accompli because the American League had to approve it. And there reportedly was a majority of American League owners that did not want to abandon the Chicago market. But again, Arthur Allen had a, had a sale agreement with Bud Selig. And uh, we covered that and we talked to Bud uh, about those days, about that whole process. And because the White Sox fell through, White Sox deal fell through. This is the backstory, but it affects baseball now. Bud then turned his uh, attention to getting the bankrupt Seattle Pilots, which are an expansion team in 1969. And he moved them to Milwaukee just before the 1970 season and became the Brewers. Yep. And now you got the Brewers and Cubs as a huge rivalry, the Brewers as a contender, and a new state, uh, well, 20-year-old stadium in Milwaukee, thanks to the efforts of Bud Selig uh, in the years before he became commissioner. So uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous backstory there. Uh, John Allen uh, went through uh, uh, a really rough season, but he changed the management. Uh, Roland Heeman brought in some new players. The Sox improved from 56 wins to 79 wins in the 1971 season. And then at the 1971 winter meetings, um, he had heard that uh, Dick Allen would be uh, available in a deal, 
And so he contacted Chuck Tanner, who was just from up the road from where Dick Allen grew up in Wampum, Pennsylvania, uh, Tanner from Newcastle, Pennsylvania, and uh, said, can you help uh, persuade Dick Allen to uh, come here? And so the deal was made. Uh, Allen kind of held out, to, as he always did with the Phillies and other teams, you know, for a salary, but they eventually uh, uh, made a multi-year deal for an enormous amount of money. It was like $125,000. Or I think it might have even been more than that, but it was a lot of money for anybody in 1972. Wow. And so um, Dick Allen was in the fold and um, the, uh, the baseball's first strike delayed the start of the 1972 season by more than a week. And Dick Allen was a hit from the get go. And um, uh, we take uh, everybody through that season and the Dick Allen backstory where uh, he was the first black star that the Phillies had developed. The Phillies were the last team in the National League to integrate. They had a racist past as far as their attitudes towards black players. Jackie Robinson, 1947, had his most trouble in Philadelphia. And, um, um, you know, Dick's, uh, a lot of Dick's attitudes were shaped by whatever happened in Philly. And we go back to that time where he had a fight with the first Frank Thomas, not the Frank Thomas that we know from the White Sox, but uh, Frank, Frank Thomas was uh, uh, a slugger back in the 50s and early 60s, twice a Cub, and uh, uh, they exchanged words in the batting cage uh, one night before a game in Philadelphia, and uh, I, I believe Frank uh, uh, kind of um, tapped uh, Dick with the bat, and Frank, of course, was a player uh, you know, on his uh, last leg, so he was the one released, but here's the problem. Dick did not defend himself. Uh, and tell the, his side of the story in the fight. I looked at the Philadelphia Inquirer's coverage, and uh, Dick was offered a chance to go in depth, and his only response was, what fight? And it ended up with Frank Thomas doing a whole 25-inch, you know, 100,000-word feature explaining his side. So public opinion turned against Dick in Philadelphia, and he became more sullen and uh, rebellious as the years went on but that didn't affect his play on the field when he was playing because he was considered a really good teammate he was an extremely productive player and in fact probably one of the top two or three pro most productive uh run producers and and sluggers in baseball during that period and so um he eventually uh he, he had another uh, tie with baseball history in that when the phillies finally acceded to his demands and traded him after the 69 season, he was traded for Kurt Flood to the Cardinals. And Kurt Flood turned down that deal, which uh, cost him basically his career, but uh, basically led to free agency five years later in baseball. Yeah, there's so many things in, in it to, to unpack there. You know, you look at the, the, the and I have to be careful because John's a huge White Sox fan and I was born and raised Northside Cup fan, so there's that bias. But it seems that there's always that playing second fiddle on a South side, as far as the White Sox were concerned, never getting all of the publicity that the Cubs did, not even thinking about the fact that the Cubs started their run and, you know, and Harry being on, at, you know, being at the bars in Wrigleyville and all, but Harry started and made his name in Chicago. Like you said, then uh, the broadcast with uh, Jimmy Pearsall, those are, well, that was on TV. That was on, that was much on later. TV. This is, yeah, yeah this people is people didn't even you know think about some of those things there. Yeah. And then as far as Dick Allen is concerned, um, you you talking about everybody always talks about, even I talked to my dad today and he's like, Oh yeah, the guy didn't seem to ever want to get along. And there's a lot more that you get into as far as the book is concerned, that he didn't feel really necessary to have to justify or share because he just went about his business. It's funny, and I know John probably don't have it it'd be george you might have it right the sports illustrated cover yeah. with him in the dugout juggling the baseball with the cigarette in his yeah. mouth and it's just those yeah. types yeah. of things just that cool cat you know that didn't didn't have to you know apologize to anybody or kiss anybody's ring he was who he was and statistically obviously as you guys talk about his performance on the field spoke you know, if you let it, spoke a lot higher and louder than people ever really realize, right? Well, Dick was not a politician, and you mentioned the Sports Illustrated cover. John, hold up the cover of the book again, yeah, because sure. 
we have a, a tremendous, you see those pinwheels, the old, the old pinwheels from the scoreboard. So we have a, a true major league star artist, Todd Radom, who did that cover. He also designed the uniforms for the Sox for the field of dreams game last year in, uh, in Iowa. So instead of baseballs, he's juggling in his uh, vintage 72 uniform, he's juggling the pinwheels, the pinwheels, which would have been set off by home runs, uh, the pinwheels on top of the scoreboard at uh, Comiskey Park. And uh, so that's, uh, that's the take on the old SI cover, juggling the baseballs there. And of course, what I also asked Todd to do was to surround Dick, and it's a tremendous idea, I can't claim credit for the pinwheels, but uh, I wanted to have some of the characters that we're dealing with, the ancillary characters of 1972 in that era, uh, Harry Carey, Nancy Faust, Wilbur Wood, who was a Cy Young Award winner with 24 wins for the Sox, knuckleball pitcher, but also Mayor Daly, who uh, overshadowed practically everything in Chicago life. And Todd's original uh, uh, drawing of Mayor Daly was kind of uh, straightforward. I wanted to show the angry Mayor Daly that we remember from the 1968 Democratic Convention. And so, uh, John, if you could show uh, Mayor yeah. Daly, he, that's basically him yelling at Abe Ribicoff yeah. there. We There's can't Daly repeat. Yeah, there we, there we go. There we go. Yeah, and then we got Harry and we got the Wilbur and we got Nancy Faust. Yeah. yeah. The funny thing was Todd originally had Harry in a, a tie and a, a sport coat. And uh, <laughs> Harry was very, very casual when he broadcast the White Sox in those years on radio. Plus, he did not have, have his entire shock of white hair that we remember from his final Cubs years with salt and pepper hair. And so uh, we, we, I had taught alter Harry to the way he was in 71. We also have several photos of Harry in all his glory stripped to the waist doing the games from the bleachers. And in fact, some of the photos we have, um, uh, one is Harry uh, being very effusive in the bleachers. And the other one was a game that I attended on August 23rd, 1972. It was a Wednesday afternoon, you know, matinee special uh, against the Yankees where Dick hit one into the faraway center field bleachers and it came close to where Harry was uh, set up. Harry had his fishnet. So we got the photo taken from, you know, behind third base of Harry waving his fishnet while kids are running to catch the ball there. And uh, we actually heard that got a hold of the broadcast where Harry saying the ball's coming to him 450 feet away. And uh, the photos really, uh, the artwork, uh, picture, the old saying, a picture says a thousand words. Uh, the photos really carry the mail in this book in addition to the text and the narrative. Uh, because not only do we have some great photos like I just described, but we had some other photos of uh, things that were happening in Chicago, like what I call a proto January 6th, when a bunch of white construction workers, thousands of them blocked a hearing on racial discrimination in the building trades. This was back in 1969, but it's, it's part of this era. Mm -hmm. And um, they ended up fighting with Chicago police. They're brothers from the parishes in Chicago. Uh, from where you are on the far Northwest side, some of the, uh, these cops and, and these construction workers are from your area there, John. So sure. um, we, I found a photo with the help of, uh, of uh, Tim Cronin, a longtime uh, uh, Southtown sports writer and, and author and golf uh, enthusiast, he noticed that somebody was selling a photo of these construction workers doing the Spider-Man act on the, on the Picasso, climbing the Picasso uh, and uh, climbing up to the top uh, of the head uh, with their protest signs. So he says, somebody's selling this on eBay. So yeah, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, you see, you see them uh, uh, being doing Spider Man. That's unbelievable. Yeah, <laughs> and this is only two years after the Picasso was dedicated, and so I found out that AP Associated Press could sell this photo, and we acquired it. I wouldn't have known about it uh, unless Tim Cronin had noticed that it, it had been uh, selling on eBay. So the photo still existed. So we went to great lengths uh, on this. We described uh, the turmoil of the times. That particular proto January 6th was lost in history because of all the anti-war demonstrations of the time. And in fact, it took place at the, at the time the Chicago 7 trial was starting. So that didn't get the publicity that all these protests in the Democratic Convention got. So we brought it back to show that 
these attitudes that ended up with the storming of the Capitol have been bubbling around for half a century or more. You want to tell me and Mark a little bit about that June 4th, 1972 game, how we get the um, title of this book, Chili Dog MVP? Sure. That was a bat day doubleheader on Sunday against the Yankees, and there were almost 50,000 people there. Uh, Old Comiskey Park, you both were there. You know it was a, a big enclosed place. In fact, when I went there in the late 70s, you could almost get high from secondhand smoke there because whatever whatever was being smoked, the... Uh, the uh, the four walls held that in, so I wasn't a partaker. But uh, you know how enclosed that old ballpark was. Yep. Well, anyway, you had this monster crowd uh, showing up. The Sox were contending. The Sox revived. Allen had not had not missed an entire game the first uh, up to the first two months of the season. Well, the Sox won the first game of the doubleheader, and Chuck Tanner decided to rest him in the second game. So John Allen, the owner, comes down to Tanner's office. He's livid. He says, what do you mean Allen isn't playing? Well, Chuck Chuck wants to give him a rest. I mean, you can't run the guy into the ground. Uh, uh, Chuck, for whatever you could uh, say, Chuck was a, um, uh, a cheerleader, uh, uh, you know, uh, smiley guy, whatever. Um, he was not Leo DeRocher. He wasn't going to run his team into the ground, especially a star like uh, DeRocher had done to the 1969 Cubs. But um, – uh, so Allen takes the game off. He soaks in the tub with a bottle of booze. And then when he gets out of the tub, the whirlpool, uh, he eats a chili dog by his locker. Well, Chuck, uh, the Sox were trailing four to two at the time. And so Chuck had an idea. He's going to save Dick for a game situation in the ninth. He could have pinched at him in the eighth, but Chuck was thinking a couple of innings ahead. And uh, so as Dick is uh, happily slurping uh, the, the chili dog with chili made by the clubhouse guy it was from Bridgeport, it's homemade chili. It wasn't chili you got at Jewel. Uh, he um, is told, uh, uh, you know, the manager wants you in the dugout. So uh, apparently he dribbled some of the chili on his uniform, had it quickly dressed and ran to the dugout. He then go, comes up against Sparky Lyle. It's a pinch at three run homer. The Sox win. It, it was, uh, as I talked to fans who were at that game, uh, they the electricity was coursing through the ballpark. Everybody kind of knew that Dick was going to, he didn't have to call a shot because he was going to actually go ahead and, and, and do it. And as Sparky Lyle went to the mound, uh, Mike Andrews, who was a former Lyle teammate with the Red Sox, told, um, told Sparky as he's walking out to the mound, Mike was on first, um, you know, base runner. He says, you're in deep doo-doo. <laughs> I'm he didn't use the word doo-doo but uh, it, was sure, a, it, yeah. was a, it was a it was a synonym they, um, for that that harkens back like to write the uh it, right with the the scene out of the natural when um mm -hmm. when Robert Redford hits the home run in in everything that you could think of that all the light stands are blown yeah, I mean but yeah. that's one of those truth is strange stranger than fiction ones to where you would never um, you know, think about that. You're talking about the artwork on the on the cover of the of, of the book, which is wonderful. I forget because again, I'm not a I'm not a White Sox fan. What year did they go from the blue to the red and put the red pinstripe and change that uniform? Was that late '60s, early '70s? No, no, no. That, that was that was symbolic. That was symbolic with their initial revival in '71. Okay. So uh, John Allen was owner for one year. They had the old Detroit Tiger style uniforms, home uniforms for two years, 69 and 70. And then, uh, I mean, Arthur Allen was copying, uh, uh, you know, what the Tigers had done with their 68 world championship. But John Allen felt that red was a powerful color and red was the color of the, the big red machine, which had just started at the time. So uh, it, those, those red pinstripes were a big hit. They were flannels in 1960 or 1971, and then double knits uh, and and uh, very tailored uniform for Dick Allen with his muscles in 1972. And they they used that uniform for five seasons until Bill, Bill Vec came over and he put in those crazy softball uniforms. Yeah, he would come out shorts. with a red shirt, Mark. He uh, was a. Uh, it, it could have been 95 degrees Allen, or it could be uh, below zero. He always wore that wet, red sweatshirt underneath. Question for you, George. Only probably you can answer this. Uh, over the years, I think it's hurt Allen. 
Uh, maybe those White Sox years did hurt him in the sense of the Hall of Fame. There were rules for the Chicago White Sox, and there were rules for Dick Allen. Is that true? Yeah, there were rules for Dick Allen. Uh, uh, I, I guess Chuck Tanner realized, you know, Dick Allen was so valuable to the team, and uh, he did not, uh, Dick Allen did not often take batting practice. His reasoning was, why should I try to hit a half-speed fastball when I'm supposed to hit a 90-mile-an-hour, whatever the top speed was? They, they didn't have the 100-mile-an-hour uh, throwers like today. But game-speed fastballs, he said, that doesn't really you know, that doesn't really help me. Now, I have a personal idea, and, and I've criticized Cub players for this. I didn't like the fact that Moises Alou would sashay into the clubhouse, the last guy in, because Moises was a known night crawler. And um, so um, I think that a player needs to be there, whether he wants to take batting practice or not. Batting practice is overrated. Joe Madden cut down second half batting practice and it helped the Cubs because of all the Cubs collapses in history. And Joe realized that's too much work uh, in the heat of August and, and, and whatever. So um, I just think that Dick Allen needed to be there earlier uh, to be with his teammates. He was a team leader and uh, you just need to be in the team, the team framework, uh, the team mindset, uh, be with your teammates. And um uh, but again, it worked for Dick. Uh, he uh, was consistent uh, from start to finish in his Sox career. And um, he, you know, Chuck Tanner was criticized and Dick Allen was criticized for this uh, uh, different set of rules. And I think Dick might have been able to help himself. He was not a political guy. We talked about this before. He's not a political guy. He didn't play the politics game. He didn't play, play the politics game with the writers. He, um, he showed up late. There's one instance where uh, the, the Sox take the field uh, for the national anthem. There's no first baseman. Well, where's, uh, where, where's Dick? Got to have a first baseman. Well, as the notes started to sing for the anthem, we hear the clop of uh, cleats in the uh, tunnel, and that's Dick running out. And by the time the anthem finished, Dick was uh, taking throws at first base. But um, that's the one thing, you know, uh, I'm going to use the First Amendment to say, I think Dick hurt himself by not being political and not being his own advocate. You, baseball, if anything, is a very political game. I've known that uh, you know, from the press box, and, and that's very political. Uh, covered baseball for over 35 years. So um, you march to your own drummer, and there's repercussions not only in your image, but unfortunately, maybe 30 years down the road when you're up for the Hall of Fame vote. Well, I, I, I think, and I appreciate you try to take care of people who are obviously very key elements on a team, whether it's a baseball team, hockey team, or whatever. But to your point, George, which is a good one, eventually the team has to take precedent over the individual because you're all part of that, even though baseball probably is, you know, obviously from all years you covered, the most individualized team sport that there is out there. But especially back in that day, you know, and you see a little bit now recently in the start of the season, guys getting plunked, a lot of guys pitching inside. And I'm sure the game was played way differently in the seventies in terms of hard slides and balls inside and guys getting hit. And that was even more important as a teammate, right? To know that everybody on your team was, had the same roles and it was going to play the game the same way. And there was that expectation that the guy next to you was a going to be there on time when you were there and you were going to get the same thing out of them. And, and maybe like you said, that hurt him long-term in terms of right. hall of fame and those types of things. No, he was a great teammate. He, even on the Phillies, uh, they, they thought he was a great teammate. And um, by the way, I should mention that, um, um, you know, Dick wanted to be traded probably midway through his Phillies career and one of the trades that the Phillies tried to make was to the Cubs for either Billy Williams or Ron Santo. Cubs turned down both uh, proposals. Uh, that's kind of lost in history. But uh, no, Dick, uh, nobody ever criticized Dick for jaking it on the field, for not hustling. Uh, he was a great teammate. He was a, gr he was a, a, a four or five tool player. Uh, he he uh, didn't have a good throwing arm. Uh, Gene Mock miscast him at third as a rookie. He was basically an outfielder, but he made 40 errors at third as a rookie. Didn't cost him the Rookie of the Year award, but 
Uh, he was basically a five tool player. He was the Sox best base runner. And, um, uh, he was a good first baseman, uh, with some range and he could dig out throws, things like that. So, um, on the field, it was great, but there's certain things you've got to do off the field, um, to really boost your team. And, um, yeah, I think one other thing that Dick could have uh, done is to be the spokesman for the new team. And again, he, he didn't like doing that. Not that he was hostile to the press, but he just didn't care about, uh, about playing the political game. George, the book, how's it doing in the sense of, I mean, you have to be really that avid Chicago fan to remember this book and especially being a Southsider uh, following the White Sox. How's the book? The book, I mean, I never thought it is a huge book. There's a lot to read. There's a lot to catch up on. I mean, it's fantastic. Every time you think, uh, every time I've indulged into it, I learn something or I remember something. But overall, how's the book doing? It was rated Amazon's uh, a leader in the sports uh, history category. Um, uh, I see encounter every day somebody who has the book. It's gotten off to a very fast start. We've gotten tremendous publicity. You're you're part of the uh, uh, great publicity. Uh, our one of our co-authors, John Owens, has been on WGN Radio not one, not two, but three times. Wow, uh, that's pretty unprecedented. WBBM radio did a spot uh, tied to opening day It keep keep rerun or rerunning it. Uh, we got some great, uh, great write up a great review by Rick Hogan and the Tribune. So all of my own books that I authored uh, through the years that you've read, both of you guys have read uh, this publicity is twice what I got for any of my books. It's, it's absolutely sensational. Well, we appreciate the publicity you generate for us. Speaking of the authors, Talk to us a little bit. I found intriguing uh, Dr. Fletcher and his relationship with Dick Allen and, and how that evolved. Can you share a little bit about that with us? Sure. As well? It's a very unique relationship that went to the end of Dick's life. Mm -hmm. Dr. David Fletcher, who I got to know sitting in the press box at, uh, at uh, Guaranteed Rate Field, is then U.S. Cellular Field, uh, in 2012, tried to uh, build a Chicago baseball museum. He was unable to build a, build a brick and mortar version. It's just too costly. There's too much politics involved. This is Chicago. What do you expect? So um, I got to know him. And around that time, uh, he wanted, he had remembered, he had this idea for the book because he had gone to 20 games for that 1972 season as a just graduated uh, player or just player, just graduated uh, student from Glen Bard uh, West High School. He was starting uh, at the University of Illinois in the fall of 72. So um, he came up with the idea not only of a Chicago baseball museum, but a 40th anniversary uh, celebration uh, of, of the 1972 White Sox. And he persuaded the White Sox to host this. Uh, so they had a bit of a, um, uh, a bit of a um, uh, on the field presentation with some, some, some of those uh, mascot type of guys that the, uh, uh, mimicked uh, the the look of Dick Allen and Goose Gossage and all that, and then they had a big dinner at the Stadium Club, and I think it in in that event in 2012 he got to know Dick Allen, he became close with them uh, in years after that, um, became close with Dick's family, his son, uh, several of his brothers, and uh, began to champion Dick's. Uh, bid for the Hall of Fame. It fell one vote short in 2014. And then this last year, posthumously, it, it also fell one vote short. And um, uh, he was so close to Dick Allen that when the Phillies tried to make amends for all the mistreatment of Dick uh, way in the past, the Phillies in the September of 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, decided to retire Dick's number 15. And uh, Doc Fletcher, uh, whose main practice is down in Champaign, Illinois, is an occupational medicine uh, specialist, uh, was the only Chicagoan invited. And uh, Phillies uh, managing partner, John Middleton, uh, who was a Phillies fan back in Dick's playing days, uh, made amends for Dick. And Dick showed up, even though Dick was starting to get very, very sick from lung cancer. Dick was a heavy smoker. And as John and you remember that famous SI cover had a cigarette dangling from Dick's mouth. I think Dick smoked uh, in all circumstances, except when he was actually on the field. And uh, 
And he wasn't the only player to smoke in the dugout in between his at bats in those days. Billy Williams told me how he used to try to sneak a smoke in the Cubs dugout hiding behind another teammate or they'd go in the tunnel. But um, so Doc Fletcher uh, ended up as one of Dick's pallbearers when he died at the end of 2020. So he, he became, he, uh, his access to the Allen family was very, very crucial. And in fact, uh, if we do come out with a second edition of this book, uh, he's made some connections with John Allen's family, including his son. So we may add that material to the book. Uh, John Allen uh, did not have a long life. You know, Dick was fortunate to, to live till 78, 79 years old. Um, but John Allen died uh, in his mid-50s in 1979, you know, only uh, four years after he had sold the majority interest uh, back to Bill Vec. It's interesting, uh, the story there with the doctor and how um, passionate fans just know no end to their passion and their loyalty, their team, whether it's a Cub fan or a White Sox fan and how that develops. But also, I think that what the book shows is, you know, people talk about who aren't necessarily as connected to sports, but how sports intertwines with their everyday life and, and it's connected. Sometimes it's a distraction and other times, you know, it's, and I think that's, as we've seen now, obviously with some of the, the movements and everything and not to compare, but you know, the, the national anthems and, and all those other things, how sports now, because of so much being more visible have become so much more um, necessarily involved and, and generations, um, older generations are still trying to figure out, right, John, we say yep. we just want to watch a ball game to watch a ball game. We don't want to watch a ball game. You know, we'll watch the news at six o'clock if that's what we want to talk about. But as right. you start to sprinkle it into, you know, our games and, and using it as a platform, it, it becomes a little difficult for um, our generation a little bit. You know, it's um, it's funny because uh, when we talk about 1972, it was an era where you and I experienced, all of us experienced as kids then, we could decide on that day, that day of the game, to go to a Cubs or White Sox game. No game was sold out in advance. The, uh, the tickets were cheap enough so that a teenager could afford it. Scrape right. together a dollar, dollar fifty to be able to go out there. <laughs> and uh, it was a little more difficult to get out to White Sox Park uh, at the time. That's what it was called because the majority of games were at night. So most of the people who went to games there drove then as they do now. And so until you got your own car, it was a little difficult to get out there. Uh, I know I took the train, the L train, all the way from the north side. And at that time, that's it's on the green line now. And that dropped you off at 35th and State. And that was nearly a four block walk past the old Stateway, the end of the old Stateway Gardens uh, housing wow. projects. And that was that was um, that was a little harrowing for kids from way up on the north side. And I know when I finally got my junker car at the end of uh, 1974, I would then drive it down to old uh, Comiskey Park. I would park on Shields at 32nd or 31st Street. They didn't have residents only parking there. And so I would just walk uh, three blocks to save the dollar parking charge. Uh, but I would always, uh, from then on, once I got the car, I'd always draw, drive there where uh, you would take the L to Wrigley Field because there simply was no no adequate parking around there. Although with the junker car and before Wrigley Field became a gentrified neighborhood, I found some places in the neighborhood east of the ballpark to park it. And nobody was going to bother a nine-year-old car at the Bastion left uh, rear door. Uh, George, those, those were eight o'clock starts in those days. Yes, they parking, were. George, that's yeah, uh, and one of the reasons one of the reasons for eight o'clock starts is that uh, and and most teams had eight o'clock starts who that played night games. Uh, in fact, they all played night games except the Cubs, was that they didn't feel the average working man taking his family, if he did, would have dinner at the ballpark. So they would uh, give, they would allow him time to uh, go home, grab some dinner, and then come out to the ballpark because you didn't have all the menu items that you have now that are $12 beers and $14 sandwiches and all that. So uh, hot dogs just weren't going to cut it for dinner. So uh, they felt that uh, eight o'clock was late enough so for the people could go home and then get out to the ballpark. But also the Sox had arrangements with restaurants around the south side, like Mama Bats on, on 22nd Street, 
uh, you could go there for dinner and then they run, run a bus to the ballpark. You didn't have that at Wrigley Field with all the day games. Now, again, you mentioned it's crucial that you mention the eight o'clock starts because this is the reason why the Cubs are number one in this town and the Sox are a perpetual uh, number two. Uh, and it still affects it today because in those days, the only this we were the only two team market in baseball where one team played all its games during the day and the other team played at night. That played into media coverage perfectly because the Cubs could have your 130 game uh, because at that time, WGN did not allow the other stations in town to use its game videotape on the news. So the stations two, five, and seven had to send out their own film crews to the ballpark so what would happen is about 3.30 or 4 o'clock, they'd have motorcycle couriers pull up to Wrigley Field, take the undeveloped film from these camera crews, rush it downtown, develop it, and voila, WGN did not have, well, they had a, a short early evening newscast, but the other stations could put film on the news at 5 or 6 o'clock. You couldn't do that with a White Sox game at 8 o'clock. Certainly for a 10 o'clock game, the game might still be going on. And games are shorter, but some games would last past 10 o'clock. So the Cubs got so much more exposure in the market sure. because of the uh, thing in the schedule and newspaper deadlines for morning papers. When you'd read about the Sox game in the morning in your Tribune or sometimes the complete Cubs story with quotes and everything and columns uh, uh, were, were featured where the writers had to rush to get the game story in the home delivered edition. Uh, of the morning papers from a Sox game. And I'll say this, David, the late David Condon uh, told me, the Tribune's lead columnist in the wake of the news said that when Sam Jones threw a no-hitter uh, uh, for the Cubs in 1955, because it was a day game, Condon had time to track down Jim Hippo Vaughn, who had thrown the last Cubs no-hitter in Wrigley Field in 1917. Hippo Vaughn worked at a a manufacturing company on Grand Avenue. He had enough time to track him down, write a story, and it was in the home edition of the uh, of the paper. And that, so the Sox suffer from that, and it was made far worse when uh, Arthur Allen jumped his WGN contract. He still had a year to go. The negotiating time was still six months in the future for a new contract. He jumped the deal to get a million-dollar-year contract from the brand-new Fox 32 WFLD. And... Uh, um, so uh, we, I, I wrote the broadcast and media chapters, how the Sox and Cubs got to where they are. I tracked things way, way, way back to 1949. When WGN was in its second year on the air, they did both teams. They did both game. They did the games for both uh, teams, I should say. When you'd have a Cubs day game, the WGN would have a newsreel crew go out to Wrigley Field, film the game, and so Brickhouse had come into the studio at eight o'clock that night to do a Cubs wrap up with newsreel footage. So in 1949, that must have seemed like Flash Gordon to watch film highlights of the game the very day that it appeared. I mean, people were used to seeing newsreel, newsreel footages of things that happened two weeks before in the theaters at that point. You had a Sox game, same time, 1.30. Uh, same distance from Tribune Tower where the Tribunes where WGN Studios were, they did not do a newsreel uh, show for White Sox highlights. Then in 1950, Frank Lane, I believe it was Frank Lane because he had just taken over as general manager of the Sox, barred White Sox home night games from being shown on TV. So, John, Mark, George. We're watching an entire Cubs homestand as kids. The entire homestand, unbroken, is on TV. You might have a Sox game from Thursday afternoon, a Sox game from Saturday, a Sox game from Sunday on. It wasn't the same. The Cubs just blew the Sox out, even when they were a, a poor team uh, on the field compared to the Sox contender, for those kids running home to watch those games. And I remember coming home, getting to see the uh, Ernie Banks uh, 500 home run against Pat Jarvis. And, and to this day, you know, in my mind, the tape is way clearer than when you watch the, the old grainy video with the bad graphics and everything else. 
but that was a huge, if you couldn't consume the product, it really didn't matter. I mean, and, sure. and unfortunately you saw that a lot, John and I, obviously big hockey guys, right? The works yeah. family kept, kept the product, those home games from us being able to watch those games. And, you know, our, for many years, our home games were even for the Blackhawks, right, John, they didn't pick the games up until the second period on WMAQ at 8.15 on a WGN, Sunday night. can I interject? Yes. It, it was even worse than that. WGN radio had the radio rights in the late 60s, and Rich King was a young producer then, just starting his career. And so they would not pick up the game till 8.15, mm -hmm. and they would, they would start the broadcast with the first period highlight show. So yeah. I asked Rich, what would you do if there, there was no score in that first period? He says, we'd have to put on a, a great save or something like that. So I, I, I'm interjecting this because this did affect the Cubs and Sox with their TV coverage because the Cubs had blanket TV coverage and that generated ticket, ticket, uh, ticket buyers. When you, you, John, you and me became adults or we even when we became old enough to buy tickets, we went out to the ballpark uh, as teenagers. Uh -huh. Uh, you know, when we had enough money in our pockets, three, four bucks was enough to get in. But I asked Rocky Wirtz about nine, 10 years ago, I said, okay, uh, your father, Bill Wirtz was partners with Reinsdorf at the old Chicago stadium. In the mid eighties, Reinsdorf put all the home games on cable TV on sports vision, sports channel, whatever the, the, the Hawks would black it out. Uh, and the, 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 even with the games on cable, you know, cable was 10, 15 bucks a month. Then they started selling out. Why didn't, and they were making much more money in advertising uh, between the, the games on TV and Michael Jordan, the, the, the bulls were a moneymaker. Why didn't Bill Wirtz understand he, he was partnering with Reinsdorf at the time and they built the United center together. Why didn't he understand the same thing could happen to the Hawks and Rocky Wirtz's answer was quote, my father was a stubborn German. <laughs> well, and, and that's it. There's no explanation. You know, he tried yeah. to sell, well, I'm trying to protect the rights of my season ticket holder. And it, it was like, again, now you put those games on Sunday nights where kids are getting ready to go to bed or you're not going to go out. And now you sit around as a family and you watch those games. And obviously that team from 09 and up until just the past sure. few years benefited from being good and having the exposure. So there was two things going on those things met, but you had, from a baseball standpoint, you could still sell an experience a 75 degrees sunny day. You want to go out to the ballpark. And like you said, you pay $4. You probably spent more on the bus driving from Harlem and Addison all the way to the ballpark to, to pay the bus fare than you did to actually buy a ticket to get into the ballpark. And it's, well, here's, here's another interesting thing about, yeah, the Sox screwed themselves up by going to UHF at a time I mean, Arthur Allen needed the money and that million dollars a year kept the Sox afloat until his brother, uh, you know, uh, assumed the ownership of the team. But here's the here's the thing. Uh, UHF had only 40 percent penetration of the market. Uh, the uh, the famous uh, uh, broadcast executive, Red Quinlan, who, who founded the Channel 32, told Arthur Allen, he fell for this line of uh, cock and bull, uh, sounded like he was selling him, selling him an advertising uh, thing, that they would have 75% uh, penetration by the time the, the, the games began on 32 in 1968. There's no way you go from 40% in November of 66 to 75% a year and a half later. Uh, people, the color TV sets were, were booming then, but not booming that fast. Uh, I didn't have color till 1978. I'm sure a lot of us didn't have color till the 70s. So yes. here's the thing. Even if you did get uh, UHF, and I got a converter, uh, like a $20, $25 converter, a little box with a loop antenna that I put on top of my 1963 black and white Zenith that had only VHF. It had a rate, an old radio dial tuner. It didn't lock into each channel, to like lock into two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine. It was a dial. So you couldn't lock into 32. So you had that grainy, yeah, that grainy uh, yeah. picture. You had that grainy picture. It was like tuning in <laughs> to a Hawks game on radio. And so that hurt the Haw that hurt the White Sox. And there are a lot of Sox fans and media experts who said because they went on 32, they've lost practically a generation of fans. Do, I have to tell you something amazing. here, Mark, real quick, because the time's against us a little bit. But I want to kind of close it off here. A big shout out to Eckhart's Press, 
uh, who uh, published the book for you guys, George, for uh, J uh, John, Dave, and of course yourself. As a matter of fact, they hand delivered the book here to me Friday when I told them I was going to have George cancel on. Eckhart's Press came directly to my travel agency and got this done. Here's what well, I got John, John, George. by the way, you know why he did that? Because he knew that you'd book him a wonderful trip to all the islands, Stony Island, <laughs> Blue Island, and Rock Island. <laughs> no, but I gotta tell you. Uh, Rock Island is extra. Rock Island is extra. You just don't get to Well, oh, you get to see the arsenal. John will get to you to see the arsenal out there. <laughs> no, but I tell you, this book and alone, the chapters, I'm not done with it. The, um, the pictures alone, what we talked about tonight, you brought back so much stuff about Chicago that's been forgotten. You kind of like revived it. I'm just telling you right now, anybody who get this book, it's not only about Dick Allen, it's about Chicago. It's about the history, like George said, of broadcasting. The, George, fantastic. It, it blows away the 69 Chicago Cup book. I don't know how to tell you that, but Dick Allen, the 1972 White Sox, uh, Transforming Chicago, George Castle, fantastic work. Thank you for coming on Angles and Attitude with me and Mark. Thank you for having me on, and I will uh, conveniently lose the invoice that you're sending out the mail to me for that praise. Yeah. <laughs> hey, no problem. We're going to have you back. We're going to give you the hat trick. You're going to be the first three-timer. Uh, yes. As the baseball season progresses, we're just going to get on and talk to State of Baseball. Deal? And I do want to mention, as we're, as we're doing this, uh, Pat Foley is about to do his final broadcast of the Hawks. And, yes. and I mentioned before we went, uh, the cameras went live. The crazy thing about this is that Pat had 40 years, basically 40 years of the Hawks. And the guy he and I grew up with, and he, all of us grew up with, uh, the, 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 the absolute mainstay of hockey broadcasting in Chicago, Lloyd Pettit, only did the Hawks for 15 years. Uh, can you believe that contrast in the in the number of times that they they were a number of years that they were on the air it's absolutely astounding that the lloyd pettit had that short of a a hockey career compared yeah. to all the greats like dan kelly and, and and of course pat foley and and everybody you know doc well, emmerich you know we're uh we're getting close we got on schedule uh in a yeah. couple of weeks doc emmerich's gonna find his way to angles and attitude so uh We'll be we'll be sure to George, ask you, you about get that us as Nancy well. Nancy Faust, you got to get us Nancy Faust. Um, if you want Nancy Faust, I will contact her. She is back in Chicago. We, she splits her time between Chicago and Arizona. Uh, she is a a donkey mom. She keeps two uh, two pet donkeys. Can I quickly tell you that story? She sure. started keeping donkeys when Bill Vec had a donkey as one of the prizes for his ballpark promotions, and nobody claimed this donkey. So Nancy took the donkey home. So she has video on Twitter of her playing uh, take me out to the ball game with her donkey Mandy uh, nuzzling the uh, keys of the uh, keyboard. That might be an all time first. Like, that might get us unbelievable ratings or yeah, might shut sure. down angles and attitude if we get Nancy Faust at a donkey on. So I will call her on your behalf. I will call her on your behalf. You got it. Thanks, George. Fantastic. Take care. Work, always. Stay well. Take care. Thank you for your, for all the promotion, all the kind words. I wish we had three hours to really oh, delve into 1972. We'll get you back. Promise. Thank you. Take care, George. Take care. Bye.